Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hey guys, okay, so I am recording this after I recorded the intro, which is why you'll hear an intro after this, but I had to tell you a quick story. So as you'll hear in the intro, I recorded this episode over two days, and the first day was a fairly normal day in Providence, Rhode Island, where I did some of the recording in my hotel room when I had a minute to kill. Now today, as I'm finishing this up, I'm in Menden, Massachusetts, and I'm headed to Southwick's Zoo later, but um, I... I didn't really, I'm homeless right now, right? I don't have a hotel here or anything. And um, so I I was like, you know, I've done this before. Y'all have heard podcast episodes uh, recorded in a lot of places on the back of a moving tour bus in dressing rooms across the country. Um, You know, what I do a lot of the times if I can't find a place to record is I go to a park and I find a far off picnic bench and I set up there and I record. That was my plan for today. What I did not count on was the fact that it is raining and snowing here in Menden, and it has been raining here for a couple of days straight. So the ground is just a puddle, and everything is a puddle. But I was like, whatever, there are covered, you know, picnic benches. So I found a park really close to Southwick's Zoo, where I'm going to be heading here. And uh, I I found it has a pavilion, like a roofed pavilion and, and, you know, whatever. So I was like, cool. All right. So I grabbed all my stuff, threw it in my backpack. And headed to the pavilion to record the the last part of Zoo News. And I hit a patch of snow and went down and slid down a hill and boom into a puddle. My pants, my shirt, everything were just soaked completely through. Luckily, luckily, everything in my backpack was completely fine. All of my recording gear and stuff um, didn't even get kind of wet. I don't even know how that happened. But um, the best part of this, too, was that not only was all of that covered, but uh, as I slipped, my iced coffee flew from my hands and came down directly on my front. So I was mud and water all down my back and uh, iced coffee and stevia all down my front. So not the best look. So I trudge my way to the pavilion through a swamp, basically a a semi-frozen swamp. And um, I get there and it's raining so hard and it's making so much noise that I am unable to record there. So, uh, you know, luckily with the bad weather, this park is completely deserted. And so I decide to head back to my car where I need to change. Luckily, I've got my suitcase on me. I've been traveling a lot this week. And so I'm like, cool, I'm going to I'm going to just get changed here at the car. So I get everything loaded in. I get out my change of clothing. And as I strip down to get ready to change this little convoy of three cars just filled with old people just drives through the park. And I'm not even kidding. I don't know what they were doing, but they literally just drove in a loop through the park as I was changing. So they got their own version of Raw Safari after dark, but like, eh, I'm homeless at the moment. So it had to happen. Um, It was definitely awkward and I'm definitely waiting for police to show up. But hey, at least I had my undies on. So, you know, it wasn't, there was no impropriety. Um, But yeah, so I am now sitting in my car since the pavilion was too loud and recording the rest of this episode. So I'm just in a a car, in a puddle with a bunch of muddy clothes in the backseat recording this episode for y'all. And I I thought y'all would appreciate that. So uh, that is my story. And um, now we'll get to the, the previously recorded intro and then to the rest of Zoo News. Enjoy. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Rasafari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. So, y'all, I am recording this episode partially here in Providence, Rhode Island, and then partially tomorrow in Menden, Massachusetts, as I am still on the road trip I mentioned to y'all last week in Zoo News. So, to catch you up on me, this week has been incredible. 
I spent my birthday with Miles and my parents, and it was a really wonderful time. Then I headed to New York City to play the NYC debut of Great Balls of Fire, which was an absolute blast. The crowd was so much younger than our shows usually get, and they were really into it. Um, You know, playing in New York is always such a different experience from anywhere else. There are a lot of challenges involved with gigging there, and I have to use a house kit, so I never quite know what that's going to look like. But uh, I will say this one was truly great start to finish. And one of the most interesting things about playing in New York is that you usually end up playing for uh, performers, actors, musicians. You know, there are a lot of those people in the crowd. Um, And they just get it on a different level. Uh, I think my favorite moment in the show was there was a point where we play one of the two songs that we play very fast. We play two songs in Great Balls of Fire at ridiculous tempos. And uh, we played the slower of the two of them. And as we finished up, uh, one of the people in the front row shouted, I had my metronome app out and that song was 230 beats per minute. No one can play that tight that fast. That's crazy. And I was just like, that's so funny to me because... Most people don't even know what that means. And um, yet this guy was tracking the tempo we were playing at. And then Jason just very coyly went, oh, you just wait. We'll top it. And we moved on with the show. So it was a it was a really, really good time. And once I was done with that show, I headed right up here to Providence. And what a visit I had at Roger Williams Park Zoo. Now, I'll be telling you more about that in an upcoming interview episode. But let's just say that it was not only a wonderful day, but a day filled with surprises that really meant a lot to me. Just all of the best kind. And now I'm starting Zoo News here before heading to Menden tomorrow to catch up with the birds at Southwick Zoo and, of course, to spend some time with the bird team there, including our dear friend Danny Poirier Larson. I am pretty excited about that as well, and I'm expecting tomorrow to basically be a perfect day. So that's been my life this week. It's just a whole bunch of good stuff in every area of it. I hope the same has been true for y'all as well. But uh, hey, enough about me. Let's get to it. All right, so I wanted to start this segment this week by talking about something that I'm seeing more and more of in the world of animals on the Internet and that I've finally seen make its way into the zoo world slightly. So I thought I would comment on it now. Uh, And what I'm talking about is AI, artificial intelligence, specifically AI created pictures of animals. Now, I've talked about this a few times on here before in in small stories. I think the most notable one was when a post was circulating on Facebook and Insta of supposed baby birds that were actually AI creations that looked nothing like actual baby birds look. Now, the one I saw spread the most was of a supposed baby peacock, which looked kind of like what you would expect Pixar to design a baby peacock to look like, but it was kind of real looking, I guess. It already had the full peacock tail and the designs were all pastel and and wonderful. It was, I admit, a, a genuinely beautiful concept. But it was just that, a fake concept, a a creation, not even a human creation. Uh, Any of you who have seen baby birds uh, know that they are many things, but cute is often a stretch, at least in terms of, like, cuteness compared to, you know, other animals. And and even the ones that are cute don't look like miniature adult versions of birds. They, They are little balls of floof. And a lot of them are little balls of nakedness, honestly. Um, And as someone who tries to educate people about the, you know, actual beauty of animals, I find this disturbing for numerous reasons. The biggest one being that, well, honestly, it's hard for reality to compete with pixelized perfection sometimes. I've had the incredible privilege of seeing baby birds of multiple species up close, and it is truly magical. But for people to see photos of those fake baby birds, 
and then to only be able to reference real baby bird photos on the internet as opposed to seeing them in person, there is a risk of the real ones appearing less cute, less impressive. The fake photos can detract from the reality of nature. And I see it happening not just with animals like birds, but with animals that do have cute babies. I've seen multiple supposed photos of baby red pandas that are actually AI creations. And I have to wonder, why? Baby red pandas are adorable. Y'all have gone nuts when I post baby photos of Miso, Zuko, Azula, Joe, Bandit, Santi, Lucas, any of the baby pandas I've gotten to see and share with y'all get huge reactions online, and, and rightly so, because baby red pandas are adorable. Also, listing that list of baby pandas that I've seen really makes me realize yet again how just incredible my life is getting to do raw safari but that's a side note anyway uh so, so yeah these these ai you know photos pictures call them what you want they're not photos but they're made to look like it uh, they really bother me and since i know that all of you that listen are super in love with animals i want to encourage you to make sure you're not embracing ai pictures of the species you love and to make sure that you call them out for being fake when you do see them in all of those you know animal lover groups that we all sign up for some or all of there is truly no plus side to the ai pictures and they are only created to get likes and engagement as a matter of fact, this became especially apparent to me when a Red Panda fan page on Facebook recently reached out to me to see if I wanted to buy the page from them since they had grown so much recently. Ew. In this case, I weirdly chose not to buy the page that uses content stolen from other creators without credit, including much of my own panda content mixed with AI images of red pandas, often coexisting with giant pandas in the same habitats that were all clearly created to farm engagement and then to try to make a quick buck. I know, weird that I didn't say yes to that offer, uh, but, but I, I was somehow able to resist it. I know, I know, it's impressive, it was hard. It was not. But anyway, so the first part of this dive here is just to tell y'all to keep your eyes out for that stuff. Don't fall for it. And if you're going to engage with it at all, please only do so to call it out as fake so that other people who look at the pictures might have a chance to not be misled. Because I do see a lot of people who think they're seeing a real animal and are learning about animals. And I, I, that just seems bad to me for a lot of reasons. But that leads me to the second part of this deep dive here, which is that I have now seen AI art infiltrate the zoo world for the first time in a, in a kind of minor way, kind of major way. I don't know, but um, I'm going to do something that I don't often do on the podcast, which is that I'm going to be vague. I'm not going to call anyone out right now because I spoke to some people involved with the decision about it. And I'm hoping that there is going to be a change made. So I'm going to give that opportunity and not say exactly what I'm talking about here. But there is a meeting or conference or something of that sort from one of the AZA groups. It could be a SAFE, a TAG, an SSP, you know, something like that. And it is being hosted at an AZA facility. And the official artwork for said event is an AI art creation of an animal that multiple facilities have in their collections overlooking the skyline of the location of said event. But it's so clearly AI. It's so fake and kind of off-looking. And I know for a fact that a lot of people are not happy that a species they not only work with, but because they work with it, take lots of adorable pictures of, is being represented by AI artwork that somehow manages to render it both more adorable and perfect than the actual animals in their collection and also look weirdly fake and creepy all at once. I just really hope this is a slippery slope that zoos and AZA groups avoid. It's one thing to have obvious illustrations of animals. I don't mind you know, using illustrations to to show things. Um, and you can, you know, 
also even do things like an obvious Photoshop where you, you take an actual photo of the animal in question and you superimpose that over an actual photo of the skyline of the city in question. You could get the same basic art without using AI. But if, if zoos and aquariums, the places where we are supposed to be, be bringing people closer to actual nature and, and where the goal is to make people actually care about actual animals, start to resort to AI, I think they will do a lot of damage to their credibility. I also worry that if you show these uh, pixel perfect renderings of an animal, you know, say something like a sea turtle, where all of the ones that live in aquariums, you know, they usually have a problem like missing a, a flipper or bubble butt or something like that. And so you're showing this perfect image and then they look at this, you know, absolutely stunning, beautiful, but not perfect real sea turtle. They might be drawn more to the fake one. It, it's not great. And, and never mind the whole ethical and potential legal debates about AI artwork, uh, of which there are many right now. But, you know, as conservation educators, I believe it is incumbent upon us to connect people to actual animals, not to computer-generated fake versions of them. So here's hoping the facility and the event in question reconsider their decision and that uh, this doesn't become the norm moving forward. So that's all I have to say about that. We're going to move on to births and deaths, but uh, we're actually going to do this backwards and start with deaths this week because um, there was there was a doozy of one that, that we have to talk about. And of course, I'm sure most of you know exactly what I'm talking about. This week, we said goodbye to the queen of the red pandas, Luna, the oldest living red panda in the history of the North American SSP. When she passed away, she was 29 years and nine months old, an absolutely ridiculously incredible age for a red panda. Luna was so smart and so sassy right up until the end. It has been one of the biggest privileges afforded to me by this podcast to get to meet Luna and spend time with her on multiple occasions. <laughs> it was incredible watching how she aged, especially over the last few years, with grace and with the seeming understanding of what was happening to her. She stuck to the ground or low places in her exhibit, which, of course, the Cape May County Zoo completely retrofitted with ramps and other accessibility devices to make sure she was having her best life. Watching her snack on her fig jam or put younger males in their place never ceased to make me grin ear to ear. The craziest thing about the story of her passing, to me at least, is that despite her advanced age, it was actually fairly sudden. She was obviously an old lady, a very old lady, and she acted like it, but she appeared happy and clearly had an incredible quality of life until just a few days before she passed, uh, with her decline happening rapidly. And uh, while the focus here is obviously on Luna, I have to say that I don't know if any keeper has ever loved an animal more than Amy, Luna's primary keeper, loved Queen Luna. Uh, when I first heard the news, I reached out to Amy immediately just to tell her that I was so sorry and to send my love. It, it wasn't for the podcast. I knew I had more than enough to say about Luna on my own. It was just reaching out to a friend and a person who I really respect, who I knew had to be hurting, and to make sure I sent my love and condolences. Uh, I'm so grateful that Amy was there literally until the end with, with Luna. I miss the queen so much, and I know a lot of other people who do as well. When I posted about her passing on Insta, I heard from so many of you. And really, isn't that the real story here? Luna was not only amazing because she lived so long, but also because she was an incredible ambassador for her species. There are so many people in this world who fell in love with red pandas because of Luna and who were inspired to help save them in the wild through donations of time or effort or, you know, money to Red Panda Network, which the Cape May County Zoo does an incredible job sharing about on their signage at the Red Panda Habitat. Uh, 
Saying goodbye is never easy, but uh, the burden in this case is alleviated a bit for me by remembering how long and how amazing Luna's life was, and by knowing that her memory will live on in the countless hearts of Red Panda fans who adored her. Long live Queen Luna. And of course, that's not the only death this week. Zoo Boise has announced the passing of Ginny, the female spotted-necked otter that lived at the zoo. Ginny was 17 years old at the time of her passing, outliving the typical lifespan for the species under human care by three full years. She was well-loved at the zoo and actually helped the zoo raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for conservation. So she will be missed. Our friends at the North Carolina Zoo recently said goodbye to Mendy and Gondar, two Hamadryas baboons. Both passed because of old age and were super popular with keepers at the zoo. Mendy was often considered the most beautiful girl in the troop, while Gondar had the best hair and the biggest swagger amongst the males. Both will be dearly missed. The Louisville Zoo has announced the passing of Teak, a 36-year-old male orangutan. Teak had a multiple-year-long battle with heart disease, which eventually became too much for him. Teak was a unique animal, as he was a hybrid Sumatran-Bornean orangutan. He seemed to really enjoy being a zoo animal, often hanging out right at the front of his habitat, where he really seemed to be intrigued by the guests, particularly their footwear, which I always find amusing when great apes are really into sneakers and footwear. Uh, It's not the first time I've heard that story, and it's always amazing. But farewell, Teak, you will be missed. The Lincoln Park Zoo has announced the humane euthanasia of Banna, a 29-year-old female western lowland gorilla. Banna suffered from both congestive heart failure and bronchopneumonia, and while her care team did all they could for her, it was simply too much to overcome, so they ended her suffering. Banna was the dominant female in the troop and was known for being great with babies, whether her own or not, and she will be truly missed. But before I move on from this story, I have to give some props to the team at Lincoln Park Zoo. I guess probably the the PR team there. Um, I really like the way they phrased something in their post about this decision. So I often see posts that say something along the lines of the difficult decision was made to euthanize or to humanely euthanize. And that's that's great. That's fine. But this release said the difficult but responsible decision was made to euthanize. And I really like that a lot. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Responsible. Because it is the responsibility of people who care for animals to ease their suffering and to help them pass from this world peacefully when it's time. Amazing how adding two words, but responsible, really, really help to drive that point home. I thought that was was very well done. And then that brings us to our births. The Oakland Zoo has announced the birth of Lazelle and Halson, two baby geckos. Their story is especially cool as their mother passed away after laying their eggs, but the keepers saw the eggs, retrieved them, and successfully incubated them all the way up to the hatching. The little geckos are doing well and are adorable. Also, if you're not a big herp person, don't sleep on geckos. Go look up uh, gargoyle geckos and giant day geckos if you're like, oh, geckos aren't cute. If that doesn't change your mind, then uh, you need help or something. I don't know. Didn't mean to be so mean, but yeah, yeah. Geckos are awesome is the point. Go look at them. Anyway, moving on. It is apparently penguin chick season, y'all. Mystic Aquarium has announced the birth of two African penguin chicks. And speaking of penguins, our friends at Adventure Aquarium have welcomed three new little blue penguin hatchlings. 
The little ones are not visible to guests at this time, but will be introduced to the colony slowly in about two months. I cannot wait to see them there. Also, this is a great opportunity to remind you all that our friends at Penguins International are currently doing their March of the Penguin Madness competition, and you can check it out and vote for your favorites. You may even find some commentary videos done by me in a voice like this. Sorry. Anyway, <clears throat> moving on again. Uh, Whipsnade Zoo has announced the birth of meerkat pups. The meerlets are being raised by their parents as they would in the wild and appear to be doing well. One thing that I found amazing in their release is that meerkats are taught how to hunt from an early age, often hunting for scorpions, which is something that I find fascinating since most of the baby mammals I get to see can barely function on their own for even a couple minutes, much less hunt. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And actually, the baby meerkats at Whipsnade aren't the only new ones around, as Cheyenne Mountain Zoo has announced the birth of two pups as well. So congrats to both facilities. Our friends at Beardsley Zoo in Connecticut have announced the birth of five cotton patch geese. This is the first time this species has been born at the zoo. Cotton patch geese are a heritage species, making the birth extra special and exciting. And the Philadelphia Zoo has announced the birth of Eros, a white-handed gibbon. He is doing well, and his mom is doing a great job taking care of him, so you can actually already see the little baby at the Pico Primate Reserve, just chilling out on exhibit with mama. Pretty cool. And then last, but not least in this section, and this is an extra cuteness alert, y'all, Zoo Tampa has announced the birth of a Malayan taper. If you haven't seen a baby taper, you have to look them up because they look like little watermelons with their patterns. It is incredible to see. The one at Tampa is particularly adorable, so check out their socials for a look at this little ball of perfection. And that brings us to the rest of our Zoo News section. And we are going to start with uh, something kind of fun. So, Last week, we saw the calendar flip from March to April, which meant that it was officially April Fool's Day. And zoos and aquariums went all out on their April Fool's Day posts this year. So I wanted to start off this segment uh, with a couple of the ones I particularly liked. Uh, some of these really tickled my fancy. The Palm Beach Zoo announced that they are opening a brand new section of the zoo, the Florida Wetlands section, featuring the cryptid known as the Swamp Ape. The renderings were done exactly like new renderings for, like, real exhibits, and it definitely got a chuckle out of me. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Florida Swamp Ape, also known as the Skunk Ape, is kind of like a Sasquatch that supposedly lives in the Florida wetlands. Uh, it was really funny to see the rendering. The National Aquarium announced a bunch of species that have recently been discovered, but that were all fake, of course, and uh, were really funny. So I highly recommend just going to at National Aquarium on the socials to get a look at all of those amazing ones. There was even like a play off of the rainbow fish. Very, very cool stuff. The San Diego Zoo Safari Park posted video of one of their sloths climbing, but upright like on top of the rope instead of hanging down. Now, it was a flipped video of a sloth climbing along a rope like usual, but it's so weird seeing it walking upside down. Even knowing it's a joke, it's like, ah, it's really trippy to see. The Dallas Zoo uh, claimed to have developed a system that translates the vocalizations of their animals to English directly into headphones that you can grab while you're at the zoo. Ah, I wish. Although I think most of it would just be food, food. I like food. Where's food? Can I have food? Anyway, the Maryland Zoo announced a new drive through portion of their Africa section where the elephants will wash your cars as you drive past. Roger Williams Park Zoo announced the latest species at the zoo, unicorns. And the Akron Zoo announced that they will be getting in Eevees, which is an adorable Pokemon that I would totally travel back to Akron to see in person. So all of these made me laugh. And while they were all wonderful to see online, I have to give a special shout out to the Sydney Zoo. Or possibly to a creative guest? I, I'm not sure, which shows how great this prank was. No, it, it was clearly a joke, but they posted this thing online claiming that a guest posted fake signs at the zoo 
and intentionally being vague about whether the joke was the signs that the guest posted or whether the zoo was posting all of this as an April Fool's joke, which I thought was really funny. Um, it cracked me up. Uh, but the, the, the signs were brilliant. The first one was for the capybara, uh, but the name of the animal was changed to Coconut Collie. And the Did You Know section of the sign reads, The capybara was created in 1943 when scientists successfully bred a coconut with a border collie. So I thought that was amazing. There are seven other signs that I suggest you look at by going to at the Sydney Zoo on Instagram or on the Facebook machine. Moving on from our jokes, Jamila, the three-month-old gorilla who started life at the Fort Worth Zoo but has now moved to the Cleveland Metro Park Zoo, appears to be settling in quite well. Initial introductions have been made, and the hopeful foster mother instantly took to Jamila, as did the other adults in the troop. Uh, they did pull her out uh, from the meeting when one of the younger gorillas seemed to be just a little overexcited. But for a first introduction, this really could not have gone any better. So here is looking forward to more updates and hopefully they remain super good. All right. So next up, I want to talk about an incredible study being done between Brookfield Zoo and Cheyenne Mountain Zoo right now. So you know how humans have blood types? Type A and B and O, and some are positive and some are negative. And I'm just now realizing that I can't remember what blood type I am. And yikes, I hope I don't get in a horrible accident tomorrow because I can't remember that. But oh, wait, there's a universal donor type, so I will be okay. So I guess I can get in a horrible accident tomorrow. Though I guess I still hope I don't. Wait, what was I saying? Oh, Right, blood types. So, your blood type is determined by what molecules live on the surface of your red blood cells. Since your immune system is trained to attack anything it recognizes as invasive, if you are given a blood transfusion of the wrong type, your immune system will attack the red blood cells with the different molecules and destroy them, thus defeating the purpose of the transfusion. So, we know that humans have different blood types. And we know from veterinary medicine that small animals often do as well. But there has never been a study done on a lot of the larger animals out there, which is actually pretty fascinating since we often tell stories on here about different species donating blood and getting blood transfusions and stuff. Well, now the Brookfield Zoo and Cheyenne Mountain Zoos have teamed up to determine if there are different blood types in giraffe. This is especially important as there is now a nationwide giraffe plasma bank that can help treat newborn giraffe calves that need help. Help that will be much better if the giraffe gets the right blood type, assuming that giraffe blood types are a thing. So I love this story for so many reasons. First, it shows the amazing cares that goes into every single animal that lives in an accredited zoo. Think about it. There is a nationwide plasma bank for giraffes. That's, that's just amazing on its own. Then add to it the fact that there are scientists working on this problem from multiple facilities. Then there is the fact that the study is only possible because so many giraffes are now so well-trained for voluntary veterinary practices that they are able to get a bunch of blood samples from a bunch of different animals to be able to study and analyze to try to figure out blood types. It's so cool. The study itself is so cool. But what it says about both the training and the collaboration at AZA facilities is, is what really inspires me with this one. The Indianapolis Zoo has built an absolutely amazing area for their chimpanzees, which officially opens on Memorial Day weekend. Now, there are all kinds of amazing trails, which the chimps have started exploring ahead of the official opening, uh, a chimpanzee cognition center, and so much more. Uh, it's going to be a huge project with an incredible number of chimps, and uh, I'm really excited to go check it out once it's officially open. Okay, now. Obviously, I'm a little biased with this next story, but I have to brag about the Aquarium of Niagara for a second. The Sheraton Niagara Falls, USA, ran an online March Madness for attractions in the Niagara Falls area, and Aquarium of Niagara was officially named the best attraction as voted by fans, beating out such things as the Maid of the Mist, which is the boat you can take up in the falls, uh, fireworks over the falls, 
the Cave of the Winds, and other world-famous attractions for a small but mighty aquarium that was quite the achievement. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon, how did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. Yay, Aquarium of Niagara. Go team. Woo! And last but not least in this section, the AZA Mid-Year Conference took place recently, at which 28 facilities were announced to have passed their AZA inspection. I won't read the list because it's 28 facilities, but yay to them. Uh, two facilities were denied accreditation at the, uh, at the meeting, and that is the Alexandria Zoological Park and the Ellen Trout Zoo. They will have a chance to appeal the decision, of course, but as of now, both have been denied accreditation. And that brings us to conservation, conservation, news time. Oh, yeah. The Wildcat Conservation Center in Australia has announced the successful placement of a cheetah born in human care back into the wilds of Africa. This is the first time an Australian organization has accomplished this feat. Edie, a female cheetah, was chosen to be the first, and she underwent fitness development, changes to her diet, and additional training and support to help her hone her predatory skills. When she moved to Africa, she was still assisted as she adjusted to changes in the climate and to her prey, being moved into larger and larger holdings that were set up in the wild, but like fenced in, to keep her safe, but also let her figure out life in the wilderness. This rewilding is an incredible milestone, and I hope the center will keep us posted on her life in the wild and learn from it and, and keep sending other cats out there. I also wish they would spell the word center right, you know, E-R instead of R-E, but those darn Aussies are going to do what they're going to do. The largest urban wildlife crossing in the world is going to start being built in Los Angeles, with completion expected in 2026. The project was inspired by the love of P-22, the mountain lion who lived in Griffith Park along with the Hollywood sign and the Los Angeles Zoo, uh, who inspired so many people in L.A. and around the world to care about wildlife. Stars such as Rain Wilson, Barbara Streisand, and Leonardo DiCaprio have donated to the project in honor of P-22. Now, to be fair, Leo may have thought the 22 was an age, I don't know, but but anyway, he donated, so good job, buddy. The overpass will cross the incredibly busy 101 freeway in an area that has over 300,000 cars drive past it daily. The overpass will have native plants as well as noise and light dampeners to encourage animals to use it. I am so excited about this project, and they're breaking ground this month. Now, on a less happy note, avian influenza, or the bird flu, is still wreaking havoc around the world. Obviously, it is affecting bird populations, but now it seems to be affecting more and more marine mammals as well. Tens of thousands of seals and sea lions all around the world have died from the disease now. Researchers don't yet understand why avian influenza is having such a terrible impact on pinnipeds, but if they don't figure it out soon, entire populations will be wiped out in areas such as Maine, Chile, Peru, Washington State, and Argentina. I'm curious to see if this represents the flu evolving or if it is just something about the pinnipeds that make them more susceptible than other mammals have been found to, uh, you know, there have been like a few cases here or there, but nothing crazy. Um, I, I especially wonder this in light of another story from this week uh, in which a human has now been diagnosed with the same disease uh, in Texas, where it is believed they got it from dairy cows that have been uh, affected with avian influenza. This is the first time during this outbreak, which started back in 2020, that a human has caught the disease uh, from a mammal. Uh, 
I have a feeling this story isn't going away anytime soon, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's also kind of crazy to think that, like, COVID and this insane avian influenza hit around the same time. Just a, what a weird time to be alive. And then last but not least in conservation news this week is a heck of a story. It's a weird one, y'all. Okay, so... There is currently a push in multiple countries to ban the sale and import of hunting trophies of animals that are listed as threatened or endangered. In the U.S., the bill that's being considered is called the PROTECT Act. Now, the environmental ministry in Germany is considering a similar measure, stating in a statement that there should be— stating in a statement? Ugh, anyway, uh, stating that there should be strict limitations on importing hunting trophies and that trophy hunting should be banned in the places it currently takes place, going further to state in their statement that in those places, people need to learn to live together with the animals. This comment did not go over super well with the president of Botswana, a country that allows trophy hunting specifically of elephants. President Masisi stated that conservation efforts have been too successful for elephants in Botswana, with the population exploding to unsustainable numbers, which hunting can help to manage. The president also explained that if countries ban the import of hunting trophies, the loss of tourism dollars to Botswana would impoverish the people that live there. As such, the president has threatened to send 20,000 elephants to Germany to roam free if the ministry goes ahead with the hunting trophy ban. President Masisi says that will allow the German people to live together with the animals as they have told Botswanans to do, and that he would not take no as an answer. I assume this is just political posturing, uh, but it, it's, it's definitely interesting and definitely something I will be keeping an eye on. It's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, no, right now, then right now it's time. It's time for other news. Hey, it's a segue to the park on other news. All right, just one story in other news this week. It's a follow up to the story of Albert the Alligator. You may remember, this is the alligator that lived right near Buffalo, New York, but was seized from his owner when the owner did not update his permit for owning Albert because of changes to uh, the state laws about alligator ownership. So, like I said, uh, when I first told the story, I, I don't think alligators make good pets, but I was a little torn about this one. It seemed like he had done a lot of good work and everything. Well, I've had the chance to talk to a few alligator experts on the subject, and they are unanimous in their belief that Albert absolutely should not be returned to his owner. The pictures show clear signs of metabolic bone disease in Albert, something that is very easy to spot in pictures of Albert's jaws if you know what you're looking for. Um, once it was explained to me, I was very quickly able to see it myself. Um, and, and that saying something because I didn't know what the signs were, you know, a week ago. Everyone I spoke to about this topic believes that the owner does truly love Albert and did his best for him, with one person in particular saying the habitat was probably the best they had ever seen in a private ownership situation, and that they've even been to, like, zoos and stuff that have worse exhibits. But that doesn't matter. Albert has a metabolic bone disease, clearly has eye issues, and in general is not in the shape that uh, Albert could be in when cared for by a proper facility. So I have to officially say that I am firmly in the camp that says Albert should not be returned. At the end of the day, let's trust the animal experts when it comes to stuff like this, even if we do like the story that's being told that they contradict. They're the experts and we trust them. It is April, which officially means you can stop hearing about my birthday. Well, except for just now when I just mentioned my birthday again, didn't I? Yeah. But anyway, hey, uh, April is Ape Awareness Month, probably because they both start with ape, and National Frog Month. 
for the week, we have uh, April 7th is International Beaver Day and also the launch of Canadian Wildlife Week. April 8th is Zoo Lovers Day and Draw a Picture of a Bird Day. April 9th is National Unicorn Day. That's not a real animal. Now, what's funny about that is April 10th is Narwhal Day. And I've heard a few people that think that both unicorns and narwhals are fictional animals. One of them is real. It's the narwhal. Uh, April 10th is also National Hug Your Dog Day and Gopher Tortoise Day. So that's cool because all three of those are real animals, unlike unicorns. But hey, whatever. And then April 11th, the day after National Hug Your Dog Day is National Pet Day. So uh, if you got a dog as a pet, they're having a good week this week. Let's be honest. If you are an animal lover and you have a dog as a pet, they're having a good week every week. But those are your animal holidays for the week. Well, there you have it, folks. Multiple uh, states, multiple towns, multiple changes of clothing, uh, an embarrassing story later. You've got your episode of Zoo News, and I hope you all enjoyed this one. Uh, I've got a really fun and exciting episode coming on Tuesday, so make sure that you're back for that. Make sure that you hit subscribe, that you're following on the socials, all those things. And don't forget that you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash rasafari. I'd like to say thank you to all of my patrons, especially my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, and Jenny Owens. And I'd also like to thank the following people for contributing stories this week. Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley Croninger, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Emily Rockbuck, Anne Yoshioka, Jacob Zinn, Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Zoe Rossi, Elizabeth Dunlevy, Sam Evans, Jay Meredith, Matt Patford, Kay Malensky, Ali Malensky, the Malenskys, now sung in a car, Marianne Rossi, Becca Robinson, and Rowena White. Thank you all for contributing. And remember, friends, the words Newsy Credits Backwards are Steiderk Yuswen. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo. Owning Albert because of changes that had been made laws. Changes that have been made laws. Yep, that's what I was trying to say.